Today on Parts Hold, we are going to talk about the three steps to remove obsolescence from your parts department. We are also going to talk about Cliff's mortality and how getting old has really been a challenge for him. And then we might banter a little bit back and forth about uh, what our goals are for 2024. That and much, much more coming up today on Parts Hold. Here to fill the order. So Cliff, it was a, uh, it's been a, it's been a pretty amazing last few weeks, right? You had a, uh, you had a birthday. So we're officially, birthday. we're officially the same age. And, uh, what, what is it, to, what is it like for you getting older? Well, 48 has been a little bit different. Um, it's funny, you know, you, you hear people say, oh, as you get closer to 50 and once you hit the 50 mark, things really change. And while that could be true, something has happened to me in the past 12 hours that's never happened to me before. So just maybe I'm wrong about this, but me at 48 and you in 48, like I'm headed this way, you're headed this way, right? Um, I feel more flat. <laughs> like this? Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's exactly. Okay. So I'm, I'm on, I'm on a slow upward trajectory and then you're, you're flat. Okay. But, yeah. but what's happened to affect that flatness? Well, uh, um, can we back up for just one second? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in October, I decided to do something that I haven't done in quite a while. Uh, but I ran some sprints, uh, um, one evening and then I decided to do box jumps on, on top of that. Now, I don't know if you do box yeah. jumps. I don't because it's a okay. uh, really good way to get, get hurt. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, got other funny stories of that I could share with you. But uh, nonetheless, I did box jumps. And uh, 20, 24, 30, I think is the way that the box is set up. And so I did uh, all of that. And um, I couldn't walk really good the next morning. So it's jacked mine now. Not only my is my right knee jacked up, but now my left knee's jacked up. And so fast forward to now, um, today, this morning, I was working out and I was doing front squats. Do you do front squats? I don't. So I was doing front squats and I was using dumbbells and I had them here and I've pulled something in my back. That's never so to me. You turn 48 and immediately throw your back out. Yeah. It, and then I went on the treadmill because I worked through it like, you know, stubborn people do. And then I got on the treadmill. So the way the morning played out was I worked out, messed my back up, walked into our bedroom to tell my wife that, hey, I'm done working out so that she could go work out and said, I think that I've screwed my back up, to which she laughed a little bit, a lot. Yeah, it's hard not to chuckle. For sure. Then went downstairs, got on the treadmill, messed my knee up even more because I decided to do uh, a smidge of some sprints to see if I could work it out. Yeah, you strike me way more of like CrossFit, um, bang it home harder than like thinking about longevity and health. Like yeah, you want to power, some. you want to like your immediate response is to power through the pain. Am I right about that? Yeah. 100%. It's like so, when you were younger and you drove your car and your car made a noise. What did you do? Drive it hard. Drove faster. Yep. Yes. So, exactly. So now take it from me because I've been 48 for a little bit longer than you. Yep. You absolutely have to change the strategy. And what I would say is that what I've learned over the last six months is I really listen to my body. So, Fair. um, so I do a lot of low impact type weight situations. Um, but you know what I've been doing lately? And this is kind of like a life lesson at the end of the day. Uh, and like, I don't know, uh, my main workout coach is like TikTok and YouTube videos that come up um, on like technique and everything like that. And what I find is that like my ego wants to do heavier weights. My, um, my body is saying do whatever builds a muscle, but also take really good care of me. Right. So what I've been doing lately, and I don't know if you've, you've ever tried this before, but 
uh, sets to failure. Have you heard of this before? Yeah, 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 for sure. Or now we're talking about reps to failure. Yep, reps to failure. Okay. So, but every but you'll do the rep to failure, then you wait four minutes and then you go and you do another thing. But but I might be using like on a bicep curl, I might be using 20 pound weights, right? Where I can right. curl way more than 20 pounds. But if you do 20 pound uh, bicep and you do the rep to failure, um, you're stressing the muscle up, but I'm not putting heavy, heavy weight on it. So what I yeah. found it might it, at our age that that seems like it works better because it's really important for everyone to understand that between the two of us, we're all, we're almost a hundred years old. Uh, 96. We're not specific. We're knocking on the door. We're, we're knocking on the, on the, on the door of 100. We'll be there before you know it. So I've had to change that strategy, but, um, but I like this because when it comes to life and business and sometimes taking chances is that like doing stuff to failure isn't always a bad thing. No, because what I, happens I mean, when you do when you do something to failure is you learn, right? It, it's it's funny, you know. So you and I have worked out a couple times together. Yep. And because we've only done more business stuff together than we've done personal stuff, I think you're a little bit surprised that I was a little bit like, "Oh, let's do this. Let's do this. Let, let's." Do. And that's a little bit of who I am on that side, uh, like. Uh, competitively, I know we've had this conversation before. Basketball is not my strong suit, no, at all. But if we were having a football throwing competition or whatever, I'm going to do that until I can get it right. And so the the uh, exercise is a little bit the same way. Um, is I if it if it so like for example today when it tightened up and it just pulled across the top part of my back. I immediately felt it. Well, to me, it's not a, a situation where I can't handle the weight. It's technique. So then I have to go back and fix, fix the technique. So to your point about business, I think business is the same way too, because we can go to failure um, and we can learn from from things that, that's happened. But a lot of times it's really our technique that really needs to be adjusted. Yeah, because you can interchange technique with process. Yes, and yes, in a lot of yes, cases, yes. and and that's yeah. what what we're really going to talk talk about now. And this is something we've we've definitely hit on it before. I don't mm-hmm. know if we've done a full episode on it, but today's focus is obsolescence. And I think that you know I'm curious to hear what Cliff says about this, but but obsolescence is definitely an outcome of a system without without question. And no one wakes up one day and, and just says, I've got a bunch of obsolete inventory. I don't know how it got here. Yeah, I think there are some people out there that, that are surprised when they continue to look at it and, and, it, and it doesn't change. And there are um, some parts managers I've had conversations with recently that, that say, well, I'm doing, you know, I'm sending back my cycle returns to the manufacturer or sending back my automatic uh, replenishing uh, returns to the manufacturer. There's a deeper issue. And a lot of times, one of the one of the we comments that you and I have made before is we're putting the band aid on a bullet wound, and I just yeah. kind of want to put a tourniquet here uh, when I'm thinking about some. Yes, yeah. we want to we want to close the wound. Yeah, stop and the stop meeting. the meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's great. Um, you know, I, and as the new year comes on us, and 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 we're, you know we're here diving into 2024. This is something that's going to be, we're going to have to get really, really strategic about. And there's a lot of issues with a lot of stores that I've come in contact with over the past year that have a real obsolescence problem and they need a tourniquet. Um, And so that's what I'm hoping to give uh, today is a tourniquet. So how did, how did you, how did you break this up? Did you do a list of like the, the, ideas to control obsolescence or do you just want to have an open conversation how are you going to frame this it's an approach to a problem uh that i want to create the solution for. great i love it well get us started all right so starting out at number three is building a network and what i mean by that is i want you you when you're thinking about obs- obsolescence and how to create create a an outcome to get rid of obsolete inventory is what I'm talking about right now. 
is I want to build a network. And what that network looks like is several different things. It could be other dealerships. There are a bunch of dealerships out there that buy obsolete inventory. Okay, and then how do you establish those relationships? Things that you're going to have to do with is just start talking to people. As parts managers, we often tuck ourselves away and we don't talk to other people. So building a network in town, I was just talking to a coworker uh, the other day, the wonderful Miss Vicky, and she was telling me that back years ago when she was a service director in a store that they networked together all the area with all the managers across all brands, and they just had this open discussion about what they were doing for, for this or what they were doing for that. And they had this whole social uh, network. Um, as a parts manager, we had a guild meetings that were in town. I'm talking 25 years ago. But building those relationships is key in, in finding out what other people are doing um, and then finding those those people. It's going to have to be all this a word of mouth thing. Um, there's some places that, that market it. But a lot of it's going to come word of mouth and, you know, just talking to people and networking through other uh, manufacturers and other parts managers. Yeah. So, you know what I would do, which is the 2024 version of that? Yeah. I'd start a Facebook group. Facebook groups. Fantastic. There's some guys out there that are do, using TikTok and, and YouTube shorts and all those those things to build a social network. So I, I completely agree. Yeah, so so that's more of a reach or PR thing, but but what if, you know, let's say that we're in Charlotte, North Carolina, and and I started a Facebook group that said Charlotte, uh, North Carolina parts managers, and then just started inviting people. Um, that would be one way to do it. And maybe it gets bigger and it becomes North Carolina parts managers. And maybe there's a nationwide one that you get to, but like the the bigger thing is to recognize if you're going to start a group and I don't think you have to have any credentials to start a Facebook group other than to basically create it. Right. But right. the thing I would want to do is, is that there's an intention level thing, right? So there's Facebook groups out there that are complain fests. There's face groups out there that are, that are way more like social than business, which I think are great too. I think that it's actually kind of fun to hop in there and just see some of the things like I've seen some great memes come out of some of the parts department groups that I'm a member of. Um, I love them to death, but there's also a time and a place for like more of a business social setting, right? Yes. So it's, yeah. it's, it's not just about the joke. Sometimes it's about getting work done and everything like that. And, and the thing that I would tell you is, is that you can have a parts coach or whatever, but, um, so many of the great ideas just come from other people trying stuff. And the thing that I think that probably is the most valuable part of our coaching program is that we have hundreds of dealers and we see hundreds of different things going on and people trying and being creative and we get to see what works, what doesn't work. But um, there's no shortage of suggestions that we're allowed to make because our world's just a little bit bigger, right? Whereas you figure the average parts manager, how many different stores do you think the average parts managers worked at? Two, three, two or three. I know. Yeah. So, so if you, if you get to a point where they're five, we don't want to hire them because they're hopping around too much. So, so two or three typically is the normal number, but you'll never be able to see what we get to see in, in a month, you know, just between our coaching staff, which is great. And then, you know, the, we can recreate that on the Facebook side with the, with a, with a group or a social network. I just read a statistic the other day. That said, 70% of car part sales are happening online. Now, if that's the case, and we're not out there putting our stuff out there, we're missing an opportunity. So whether it be Amazon and eBay and seeing if they're the right fit for your business model, ultimately, I just want to get my old inventory out there and in front of people and figure out how to market that to somebody. So that's another piece of the whole networking is not only am I contacting other dealers and finding out what they're doing, but I'm contacting other avenues. And again, Amazon and eBay are great opportunities for you to be able to put some old obsolete inventory on there and sell it. Yeah, I think that the thing that I'm kind of hearing you say, though, is is that if you want to get really good at getting rid of obsolete inventory, and you know, I think step one is to not have a ton of obsolete inventory, but the thing that I'm really hearing you as a theme is, is that how many different like exit strategies should you have for obsolete inventory? I think it's unlimited. Yes. 
What do you think most parts departments have? How many avenues do you think they have? Zero. I think they have one, the manufacturer. Like it's the return. Yeah, you know, the the thing that I, uh, it, with this approach, with, with my approach to it, with our approach to everything, um, and we just had a call recently that Chris honed in on this really, really hard, is being offensive on it. Most of the time, it's a defensive strategy for obsolete inventory is, you know, uh, whatever the approach is. But I ought to be offensive and attack it and get rid of it. That's where yeah, de- the defense. Out. Yeah, defensive is where the inventory just happened to you, which yeah, is just, not true. Yeah. It just happened. We just, it just, we woke up one day and that part was twenty seven months old. Right, right, right. It's it's uh it's really really interesting. But when you're talking about a part that's twenty seven months old, you and I had this happen, but I just had it happen to me at another store, and that brings me to number two. Is that where you went into a store and looked at the sticker and it was peeling? It was sold? Yeah. It, well, in this case, it was a part that I knew, know based on the labeling of it that it was guaranteed inventory and it was from 2021. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's so, a couple number, years old. so number two is using and um, making use of the OE return policy. Because in this case, in this particular store, they said they were using the manufacturer return policy, but based on this part being there, they're not using the manufacturer return policy. Not to its full capabilities. Why? What do you think it is that keeps people from using those programs? Um, I, I think it's people, I, number one, I think it's fear. And number two, and two is kind of a little bit, I can appreciate it, is you lose a little bit of control. Just a little bit. Okay. Okay, explain that. Well, because most parts managers are, by by nature, we're a little bit controlling. We want to control our inventory. We want to control what goes in and out of the computer. We want to control what comes in and is leaving. Um, and, and so we lose a little bit of control because it's not just our phase in, phase out criteria that allows a part to come into our inventory. It often is what the manufacturer is telling, we, telling us we need in our inventory. And so so that, it's really the the stubbornness and being told what to do, kind of. It's, it, yeah, it's a little childish when you say it like that, but to a degree, yeah. Um, but there's a fear of of what if I let go completely. Now, um, I will tell you that's guys that have, in most cases, the ones that I've experienced is that's guys that have been in the business a really long time that already have a really good system, and. Um, this would just help their system be even better is what I would hope that they would see. But a lot of times uh, the ones that I'm, I'm talking about in particular are some of the younger guys that aren't watching it. If I'm not watching it and measuring it, um, it, it's, it's a missed opportunity. I also am wondering if it's not to a little bit of a whole, like, it's funny. It's like when you have, obsolete inventory for instance it's like there's a thing where um if it's on your shelf there's still a chance it might get sold even though the chances are slim statistically and everything like that but it's like once you send something back or get rid of it it's then it's like a failure or a loss or whatever it is and maybe that's what it is is that the parts manager that that's not utilizing all these programs to the best of their ability is like they don't want to admit the loss but the truth is, is I mean, have you ever seen a perfect parts manager? No. Have you ever seen a perfect parts department? No. Never. It's okay if you're not perfect. No, I think the the, the thing that that they that we miss out on there is is taking the time. You know, on some of the manufacturers, you've got to do that monthly, and so if you don't do it monthly, you miss out on the opportunity to return it. And so. If, Build a system in place. So for me, because I'm a guy who, we, we, you know, again, we talk about writing it down. But when I was a in, in a, a standard office and even in my office here at home, if I turned my camera around and showed you my whiteboard, I write things down because I like to be able to mark things off. So, for example, this week. Oh, you get a little dopamine hit when you cross stuff off. Yeah, it, 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 makes, it yeah. makes me feel good. So 
for me, if I were tracking my inventory and it was $100,000 and I had $2,000 of obsolete inventory, I would write $100,000 inventory, $2,000, and being able to cross $2,000 out and make it $1,800 or cross it out and make it $1,000, like, it would make me feel really, really good. And I know what's tracked and measured tends to change. And, and so that's another area for me too. But with the with the manufacturer thing, it's in front of me. And so again, if I'm putting it on a board in front of me and I'm, and I'm really strategic about it, I'm checking it every month. And so, okay, I get four parts to send back. Okay, this month I get 10 parts to send back, whatever the number is, but I'm paying attention to that. Too often, we're not making use of what the manufacturers put out there for us to use. And we say that we just don't like it instead of figuring it out. Yeah, it's really easy to say you don't like it. What would make you not want to take advantage of the program is the same thing that gets you into it in the first place. I just think that obsolete inventory is a symptom of a failure to pay attention or like an attention to detail, if you will. But like you said... If you have the obsolete inventory, and I, I think that's it, right? Like your obsolete inventory is a daily conversation. Um, yes. How much do we have today in obsolete inventory? And like you said, you write 2000 and then it goes down to 1800, 1600. Then maybe it goes up to 1750. And like, it's an ever moving number. But if you're paying attention to it every single day, um, it's not going to be a big number. Not yeah, if you're paying mean, attention to yeah, it. Yeah, And it may change. It may go from, you know, 16 up to 22 and, you know, um, I, it, it could fluctuate all over the board, but I would certainly have it in front of me and, and be watching it. I can tell you 100% when I walk into a parts department, I talk to a parts manager, I can tell whether or not they've got an obsolete inventory issue before I see numbers just by asking them to run to the report. And then if they struggle with it, they have an inventory issue. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I've got a you couple of Don't even have to gone- see the numbers. No, I've gone into a couple stores recently and told them names of reports uh, to run. And they're like, I've never run that in my life. Yeah. Now, they could be running it a different way, but uh, nonetheless. So and, and num- at the end of the day, it's it's not their fault because the the one thing that I would tell you that's really consistent is where whatever brand, wherever you're at, um, that the main teacher uh, for parts managers is tribal knowledge. Yeah. And you follow their step step footsteps, pricing, inventory. Yes. Everything. Agreed. Yeah. It never occurs to you that the person before you could have been doing it wrong. Yeah. Or a chance to be, be better. Right. Or that there was something's changed since then. Right. All right. So you're down to your number one. Number one is identify the cause and two areas of, uh, focus that I would challenge each manager to take a look at and director is what is your wholesale return policy written? What does that look like? And where are you compromising in that area? So a lot of times I've gone in and said, hey, what's your wholesale return policy? And they tell me the return policy. And then they change the return policy whenever a wholesale customer returns something. Mm-hmm. So there's not a, not a hard line in the sand on that. And if we're going to be in the wholesale business, returns are a part of the business. Uh, but you've got to be really, really strategic on the way you handle those wholesale returns. Because in most cases, they're getting you into a lot of trouble. The other area that you can about rest assured, I could walk into any parts department anywhere in the nation and walk to this shelf immediate, immediately and figure out what's going on in the department. Special order parts. Yes. You know what their, you know what their obsolete inventory looks like based on what their special order parts bin looks like. That's there great. is a direct correlation. And so if there's not a written policy for your special orders and how you're going to do business, that's got to be something that you've got to get done too. Because oftentimes we're sending stuff back and we might be doing it on a consistent basis, but it's not changing because we didn't treat the cause of it. We're just treating a symptom. And you know, like we said at the top, putting a Band-Aid on a bullet alone, I want to put a tourniquet and uh, I want to get in control of my special orders. Really, really, and you want to re- you want to remove that bullet? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's for sure. It, you know, and and I'm not saying that you flip the special order process upside down. Although in some cases we've had to do that recently at some some different places. What I am saying is that's a big contributor to it. And if a parts manager looked themselves in the mirror right now and asked themselves who is responsible for getting those special order parts picked up, 
probably eight times out of 10, they would say service or have you ever ordered it? But ultimately, it's the person looking back at them in the mirror. Yeah, but the the, ma- the main answer on the SOP is this, right? You go to service, they say it's parts. You go to parts, they say it's service. But we all own it at the end of the day. And it's the way to get really, really good is to get good at SOP. Yeah, and I really wouldn't care who, what finger gets pointed. I just want to get a process in place and manage a process and stop the stuff from, from getting in my inventory. Because oftentimes we... A large contributor is we order it for a customer. They don't come pick it up. And what do we do? We put it on the shelf. We don't have a return policy. We haven't identified what our OE manufacturer's return policy is. So it just goes onto a shelf instead of going back to the manufacturer. Or I use their inventory, my my return allowance to send that back. And it's just this whole vicious cycle. Uh, but at the start of the new year, I would want to get some some systems in place to control returns, and special orders uh, because they are contributing to your obsolete inventory. Yeah, let this be the year of a clean inventory, right? So can you just recap those three? uh, What do you want to call them? Like symptoms of obsolescence? How do you want to describe this? Um, I I really want to do this more as a map of how to get my obsolete inventory corrected. So number three is build a network. Number two is get really, really good at identifying and how to use OE manufacturer return policies. And then number one is I want to d- identify the root cause. Okay, so so we'll call this like the three steps to remove obsolete inventory. How's that sound? Yes, I love that. I love it. All right, good. So, uh, so I'm super excited for what this year holds. I expect fixed operations in 2024 to be the absolute star and highlight of the uh, departments, uh, you know, essentially of the dealerships all over the United States and Canada. So um, whether uh, whether you want that spotlight or not, it's coming. So parts managers, the best parts managers are going to stick out in a really, really good way. And the parts managers that are struggling with some of these topics that we've addressed over the last couple of months, they're also going to stick out in just in a very different way. So you want to you want to be ready for the spotlight when it's your time. You don't have to go chasing a spotlight, but just be ready when uh, when it comes on board. So um, we, have, we have more topics coming up over the next few weeks about uh, how parts departments are going to become the star of the show. So uh, stay tuned and see you next time on Parts Hold. Here to fill the order.